You know, back when Sarah McLaughlin was a teenager in Halifax, her high school yearbook declared she was destined to become a famous rock star. So whoever edited the yearbook that year, full marks for that, because Sarah was able to capture in song what a generation of young women felt and at the time couldn't find on the airwaves. How did she connect? For some of you, it was the singles. More than 400 million records sold. For others, it was all the soundtrack stuff, the songs that helped create moments in the movies. Every hour we spent together lives within my heart. But that yearbook might have mentioned that Sarah was also destined to make a difference. Sarah founded Lilith Fair, the all-female concert tour that helped usher in a new era of women musicians in the 90s. Lilith was a huge success, raised more than $7 million for charity, and positioned her as the modern face of feminism. Plus, her ad for the ASPCA has raised millions for the organization. Will you be an angel for a helpless animal? But it's not all been easy for Sarah McLaughlin. 2001, she lost her mother while pregnant with her own first child. And then in 2008, she separated from her husband of 11 years. She says that the collapse of her marriage sent her down a long, dark road. And suddenly, she found herself a single mom with two daughters. Now, two years ago, she returned to Lilith Fair after a 10-year break. But sales were a little bit different than they used to be. Shows were canceled, and something had appeared had changed in the culture. But what? Still, Sarah remains undeterred. Her school of music continues to fund music lessons to disadvantaged youth in Vancouver. And next month, she teams up with Rick Hansen to celebrate the 25th anniversary of the Man in Motion Tour. Thank you. Oh, no, thank you. Welcome to our show. Thank you. It was, uh, you were just, Sarah was just in Ottawa uh, with a Blue, Rodeo, a Blue Rodeo tribute at the Junos. How was that? Yes, uh, it was a very early morning yesterday, <laughs> getting, <laughs> getting home. It was a lot of fun. Yeah, they're a great bunch of guys. It was an honor to be able to tribute, uh, to pay respects to them in that way. So It's kind of interesting, too. You think their first record... 87, but 89 is when Diamond Mine came out, right around the same time your stuff was out, too. Yeah, and you know, they've been together 25 years. It's pretty impressive. It's hard enough to do it as a solo artist, never mind in a band, right? Yeah, and they they all still really get along. What's cool about, about that for you, though, is because even if you're going forward, being a part of somebody else's tribute allows you an opportunity to reflect on those times. Are you mm. the kind of person that reflects? I, I did. When I was asked to, um, you know, help create a speech uh, to honor them, you know, one of the questions was, you know, what, what's one of your fondest memories? And it didn't end up in the speech, but one of the things was I was very, very young in the Canadian music industry when I did Five Days in July with them and still felt to a certain degree kind of isolated, like, you know, Toronto was sort of the center of the music universe and I was way out in Vancouver, had, having come from Halifax and um, didn't really feel a great sense of connection with the music industry, which actually, and, and with the artists within the industry, because really it's a pretty small world in Canada, even though we're very diverse and very spread out. And um, being invited into the inner sanctum uh, of Greg's home in the country and being involved with all these other great musicians that were there as well, I really, I felt really um, welcome and it was a really inclusive uh, feeling, how which was the first time I felt that like that. You? Well, it really it changed, it changed things for me. It changed the way I felt about Toronto. It changed the way I felt about the music scene there. Um, I just felt really, really, really welcome, and that was a, and, and part of it, as opposed to outside of it. Did you take the opportunity to bring people in then when you became really successful? Absolutely, and I was also thinking about that, that maybe that's part of what informed my desire to, to bring other people up as well. Like, they, they were quite well known at the time, and they were giving a lot of young up-and-coming artists an opportunity to shine on a, on a larger platform, so... Certainly with Lilith, that was a, a big part of the reasoning behind it. What do you think about Lilith Fair these days? If you, have, if you think back, what were the memories that, that really stayed with you? Um, well, I loved it. There I loved it. There was nothing like it. There was nothing like it, and it was really a bit of an F you to the industry at the time, too. It was, you know, well... <laughs> Mostly because, mostly because I had so many people, like the old school guys within the industry, saying, well, you can't put more than two women on the same bill. People won't come. Yeah. I know, it seems asinine. 
and it certainly did back then even more so. And I thought, well, anybody gives me a, a dare like that, I'm just going to push twice as hard to make it happen. I thought, well, that's just ridiculous. Of course we can. And just for that, we're going to put 10, ten on the <laughs> same bill. <laughs> and it, was, it worked. You know, when I, uh, when I used to work in rock radio, there were even questions. They didn't even want to program two female artists back to back with singers. Same issue, right? same issue. I remember there was a lot of artists like Tori Amos, um, Sinead O'Connor, um, Tracy Chapman, mm. all came out around the same time. And there, there was often, we were often chasing each other in the sense of, well, we added, we added uh, Tracy Chapman this week, so we can't add you. Right. It's like, we don't it's not anything alike. It's totally different. But there, were, there was definitely a lot of that. But what was interesting about that, too, is when that happened, there was this groundswell. When you brought Lilith Fair back, did, was that audience different? I mean, because there wasn't the same numbers in the same movement. What changed? Uh, well, people were 10, 12 years older, for one thing. A lot of the young women who came to Lilith back then now have kids at home, um, have busy careers, and I think we expect a little bit too much from people, and I don't think we did enough due diligence in, in discovering how our audience had changed and how to reflect that in a new show. We kind of threw up the same model, which, you know, obviously in hindsight was quite stupid. And um, it think... didn't get the audiences that we expected to get. And, and it was also around the same time as there was this huge backlash with so many shows being put out at the same time and expensive ticket prices. And there was just sort of this, this snowball effect of a lot of negativity around tours in general. And we were always a target anyway, so right. it kind of... Do you think that the audience was different, in not, not in the original Lilith Fair audience, but the mindset of a 24-year-old you know, ticket buyer is different now than it would have been a 24-year-old? And not just the female ticket buyer, because not just women went to Lilith Fair, but is it, is it different now? Like, the relationship with feminism is a different thing now than it was back then? I, I think that perhaps, the, um, yes, I think there's a little more complacency with some of the younger women who are coming up these days, and I'm going to probably get in trouble for saying this, but I think that so much groundwork has already been laid, and there's this sort of sense of ease of, well, we're all equal now, and, you know, there's, but no, there's still such a ceiling, and there's still so many opportunities and jobs that aren't open to women, and they're not getting paid as much. And they're if not you getting equal pay in this country. No, they're not getting no. equal pay in this country, and if you look at that, it's pretty much straight across the board in most industries. So I wonder so. what you thought, because, you know, I look at some of the pop artists, because you guys would book pop stars. You were a big pop artist at the time, tons, sold mm -hmm. tons of records, and... Now it's Nicki Minaj singing ass, 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 ass. And I think, God, how does that work? I don't listen to the radio. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> maybe I know why. Well, there's a few shows. There's a few shows I listen to on the radio, but, but not a lot. And, uh, you know, I actually, my, my girls, they only listen to the radio in, in the car on the drive to school, and it's not in my car. It's when their father takes them. They're like, really? what are you doing? Don't play that. I don't, you don't want them to know about those things. But, you know, you can only protect them. My, ten, my almost 10-year-old daughter has read the first Hunger Games. Um, and I was hesitant to do that, but I read the books myself. And I thought, okay, I think she can manage this. Because it's one thing, I'm getting totally off topic, but it's no, one, no it's, it's one thing <laughs> to manage one's own imagination when reading it. I went to see the movie. I was gutted. Really? I don't know. Has anybody seen the movie? Yeah. Okay. It's, it's so emotionally draining and intense and I think damaging for kids to see. And I know one of the girls in her class went to see it and I think it's just way too young because those images, once they go in, they don't ever... You mean the violent images? The, yeah, and they're children killing each other in gruesome ways. And I just don't think that's a healthy thing to show kids. The, the other side of that, though, is that the... the, the um, Gee, I'm promoting another record here, promoting another thing completely here. But Katniss, the lead character, she's an incredibly strong female character. So for that, I think, um, is a really strong role model for girls because she's incredibly moral. And she, there's this inner dialogue continuously about how she has to try and make the right decision. And she pretty much always does, but it's always with, you know, a good dose of self-loathing. And I mean, I loved her. <laughs> well, <you> know, <laughs> I, really, I related a lot. The, the idea of Sarah <laughs> being connected to, uh, to issues bigger uh, than her own record uh, are not new. In fact, we had an interview from you years and years ago. Watch, watch this, Sarah McLaughlin. <laughs> I'd like to get back to where it was oh. 20 years ago, the attitudes of 20 years ago in the 60s. Maybe it was rebellious, but they wanted to do something these days. It's, now there's a resurgence of that now of people being environmentally aware and politically aware especially me living in vancouver is really good for me because in nova scotia there's not so much of that it's really 
it's, it's quite separated from the rest of the world. And Vancouver is very it's aware very environmentally and everything else and socially aware. That's 20 years ago, wow. uh, pretty much when you did that, right? And 1989. And by the way, you, you were right in what you were saying, but you were talking about 20 years ago. So now, mm -hmm. fast forward 20 years, is it what you thought it would be? Has um, that movement changed? Is there a more engaged group of people? I, I think kids today are way more engaged. They have to be because they're way more aware of what's going on out there in the world. And um, to a certain degree, they're desensitized, but they're also, uh, because of the internet and because of the fact that we are a global community and that's being taught in the schools now, whereas when I was growing up, it certainly wasn't. We were completely isolated, and um, so I do think that's a good thing. And there's a lot of social programs that are existing within the schools too. Um, How'd you get involved with Rick Hansen? Because Rick Hansen is a, is a way that, I love Rick Hansen. for a lot of us, we first, you know, he was this first guy. We went, oh my God, Rick is really making a sacrifice for everybody else, for people he'll never meet. Mm -hmm. That was a great example of civic engagement, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely, and he's just—he's also just one of the sweetest men you will ever meet. He is so kind, right to his, down to his core. And just having the opportunity to speak to him briefly the other day when we were doing some press, he's just so lovely, so lovely. And yeah, he did so much for so many people that he didn't even know uh, with his Man in Motion tour and, and his continued fight to, um, you know, for, for spinal research and everything. So I just think he's such a fine example of a great Canadian who is doing great things. Do you think there's fatigue with the audience? Because there's so much negativity you hear when a celebrity does something. I always find mm. it fascinating how yeah, the there's audience... There's always a backlash. There's always a backlash, <laughs> but there's never a backlash when the celebrity sells you a soda pop, you know, or you know, five commercials well, have five... No, I don't know. I disagree with that. I think... Not I... the same way. Mm -hmm. Queen Latifah or, or, you know, pick anybody sells you a makeup or pill, whatever, and people go, oh, it's I okay. I suppose so, yeah. It's not the same way as if you go out there and promote feminism. I don't really pay much attention to that because, you know, I've always just followed my heart and followed what I felt was the right thing to do. And um, I think if you allow yourself to buckle to some stupid public pressure that really has nothing to do with your, your immediate core values and the desire to try and create some sort of positive change in the world, mm -hmm. you know, I think if you have good intentions and... Then who cares? Then who the hell cares? Stick around more, sir. We're blocking right after this. But if you would join us, go to strombo.com slash tickets for more. Amy. Hey, Amy. Guess who we hate? <laughs> Sarah McLaughlin. <laughs> we made a pinata. Oh, Jesus Christ. <laughs> oh, I know brutal. her. She's a genuinely nice person. It's totally uncool. Seriously, cut it out. Hey, there's a little bit of a mess right here. Can you clean it up? I'm leaving. <laughs> this is the other part I saw. I had to go on YouTube hey, to see it. Oh, hey, Sarah McLaughlin. That's your stuff. <laughs> no problem. Oh, she's so great. Did they really make a pinata of me? Yeah. Who does that? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> that's Sarah McLaughlin. That's from Portlandia. My acting debut. That, that is your debut, right? <laughs> Okay, first, roses. first of all, it's, it's you and Amy Mann in the same scene, which is pretty amazing. It's pretty fun. But you yeah. also get to take the piss out of yourself in that as well. Um, well, I'm Canadian, so that's... Comes with part of yeah. part, right? Part of course. All right, so <laughs> anthropology time for you. Do you have a nemesis? Hmm. Okay, that's yes, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> so let me rephrase that. Who's your nemesis? Uh. I'd have to think about that. I'm, I'll let you think about it. We've got a few minutes. <laughs> um, when your ASPCA ad comes on TV, do you watch it? Hell no. <laughs> no, I can't watch it. I just start bawling. Do you really? I do. <laughs> Is it the three-legged dog that does it? Yes. When that, when that commercial comes on, I'm like, Sarah, I love what you're doing. Why are you doing this to me? <laughs> I know. Well, it worked like a hot damn. I think yeah. that generated over $30 million for the ASPCA. That's the best way to use the music, too, right? Yeah. We have, a, we have a, another question coming in from the outside for Sarah McLaughlin. Thanks, George. So, Sarah, you know, your commitment to animal rights is legendary, and I think it's fantastic. But I got to know, is there one species that you kind of go, no, oh, I don't know about that one? <laughs> I love that. 
Rick Hansen wants to call you out on one. Uh, uh, one yeah. species. Yeah, like I hate lemurs. Not one breed. No. One species. Um, gosh, hippopotamuses are pretty violent. They're dangerous. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but they're still kind of cute. Remember, re read the headline online tomorrow. Sarah McLaughlin advocates for the disappearance of hippopotamus. <laughs> Rick Hansen's fault. It's so great to see you. So Sarah's going to be at the Rick Hansen celebration, a 25-year concert, May 22nd in Vancouver at the Pacific Coliseum. So make sure you check that out. Also kicks off her Summer Symphony Tour, June 22nd in Tirana. Sarah McLaughlin, everybody. We'll be right back.